did you become interested in gerontology? Well, I have a very unusual story. I was teaching high school in Watts in Los Angeles, and I decided that was right around the time of the Watts riot, so I decided I needed to change professionally. So I went for an interview. Um, one of the places they sent me was to the Andrus Gerontology Center at the University of Southern California. Now, in my ignorance, I was trying to figure out, okay, gerontology. The only thing I could figure out is, well, that geritol. So geritol is for older people. So maybe that's what gerontology is. So I went and I interviewed with Dr. Jim Buren, who is a very famous gerontologist at the University of Southern California, Dr. Maury Hamovich, who was the dean of the School of Social Work. This was on a Friday afternoon, and I started work on Monday morning at the Andrews Gerontology Center, and they hired me as the director of continuing education and summer programs. And so um, for, that was 1968, and uh, while I was there, that, uh, that is really, you know, it was just being in the field and putting together educational programs for professionals, because at that time, really, people had almost no training in gerontology or aging in terms, and so it was a great opportunity. I always said to Jim Buren, I want to take, you know, the ivory tower to the community. And so that's what we did. We offered continuing education programs and summer institutes on aging. I still run into people who talk about, you know, these programs. And then while I was there, not to dwell on this too long, but um, many of my bosses, quote unquote, were presidents of the Western Gerontological Society. And so what did they do? They put me to work to do their work and putting together the conferences until it got to the point that we were getting over 2,000 people coming to these conferences. And I was then on the board of the WGS, Western Jarrett, and they, uh, they said, how would you like to become our executive director? Of course, they had no money. But I said, I will do it, but only with the stipulation that they will be headquartered in San Francisco. So that's how I sort of fell into gerontology, but it was very exciting because it was such a new time for the field. So at what point did your, in your career did you embrace gerontologists to describe yourself? Well, I haven't really tended to call myself a gerontologist because I don't, as much as Jim Buren tried to get me to, you know, go on with an academic degree in gerontology, I, um, I always used to tease him and say, you know what, I like what I do, and I don't necessarily feel that in order to do what I do, I need to necessarily have a PhD. And uh, so then when I went to become the executive director of the Western Gerontological Society, um, I certainly view myself as working in the field of gerontology and in the field of aging. It's just that I haven't necessarily identified or classified myself as a gerontologist. Did you have any female mentors who impacted your moving to gerontology? Well, you know, it's interesting because at the Andrews Center at USC at that time, almost all of the leadership were men. So, uh, you know, whether they were biology or architects or, you know, because I remember when I first uh, started there, I was like, so what do I call somebody with a PhD or an MD? Do I call them doctor? Of course, all these people would say, just call me Yosef or Yatsik or Jim or, you know. <laughs> uh, but um, so I would say at the Andrews Center, Ruth Wegg was one that um, certainly had an influence on me. And then as I moved into the Western Gerontological Society and then in the future, we became the American Society on Aging. There certainly were people in leadership roles who were terrific mentors to me. You know, people like Carol Estes and Jeanette Takamura and Donna Yee and Joanne Handy. And, you know, so there were quite a few. Um, and of course, I would always go to, because as the exec at, at WGS and then ASA, 
I always went to the Gerontological Society meetings, and uh, you know we were very actively involved with with both them and with the National Council on Aging and and other aging organizations. Okay. What is unique about being a woman gerontologist? Um, well, you know, this is a kind of difficult thing for me to say, and you probably <laughs> want me to say it, but. I, well, I think that the role is, as a woman, has sometimes been difficult for me because I haven't always found that other women were supportive. It tended at times, and what people would say to me, well, Gloria, they're jealous of you because you have this, you know, president, CEO role. and. And I said, well, but aren't we all supposed to support one another? And because that was the thing that was important to me was to be able to help others, and especially my staff and others in our leadership and so on, to be able to have those opportunities, especially as women. And so sometimes it was disappointing to me, you know, that that wasn't always reciprocal. <laughs> How has being a gerontologist interacted with like, your own personal aging process? Oh boy. Um, well, I think that, um, you know, I've had the opportunity that because I was putting together educational programs and had just fabulous faculty that were teaching the courses and seminars and so on. I learned so much from all of these people and from putting together these programs. So I think that I've been able to take that information and attempt to use it, you know, as I myself, uh, as I always say to people, all of a sudden I discovered I was working in the field of aging for years and all of a sudden I aged in place, so. Do you see any difference in uh, diversity in uh, people of color and aging? Well, interesting you should ask that because one of my major commitments, and like ASA was one of the first organizations where we had a lesbian and gay aging issues network and we had a, uh, you know, groups for persons of color and, um, you know, just all sorts of different constituent groups. And then we tried to influence other organizations to do the same. And we had a wonderful partnership with like the National Hispanic Council on Aging and, and uh, all of the various ethnic groups that have their own national organizations. And so it was really exciting to be able to collaborate with them. And yes, I mean, there certainly are difficulties and so on, but um, I'm not always happy when people assume that if you're a person of color and aging that you're poor and unhealthy and, you know, because that's just not true. Yes, just like any, whether you're Caucasian or of ethnicity, certain people are going to be having difficulties, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, as you say, whether you have lifelong disability or whether you age into disability. The WIGL project focuses on the legacies of older women gerontologists. Within that framework, is there anything else you would like us to know? Hmm. Well, I think that there are so many women. I mean, I know that the other people that you're interviewing here is a part of your, your project. Um, you know, people that have just made enormous contributions to the field and that I am so pleased that the American Society on Aging has taken the opportunity to make sure that a lot of those people are given awards for their work, because oftentimes it would tend to be the men that would get the awards and so on. And so I think, because I just think that, um, I think particularly in the practice and professional community, there of course are so many women, you know, the social workers, the nurses and so on. Uh, and that's not to say that in the academic community there aren't as well, you know, the academic and research community. But um, so, you know, that's, I would say that's pretty much. <laughs>